One day, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord. Well, if you would, find the insert uh, that has the sermon notes on it, and you can follow right along today. There are two accounts of the four Gospels that Jesus was amazed at someone or at something that happened. Boy, wouldn't it be great if Jesus was amazed at you? If he said, wow, man, Susan, I am amazed. Jonathan, I am amazed. Wouldn't it be great to hear that, that Jesus thinks we're amazing? Well, the first account took place in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, uh, beginning at verse 6. After the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus comes down and he encounters a, a man with leprosy. He heals him. And then Jesus is approached by a Roman centurion. A Roman centurion who says, I have this servant at home who is paralyzed, and he's in terrible distress. Now, I'm sure a hush probably came over the crowd as they thought, what will Jesus do? I mean, Jesus is a Jew, and he's been healing Jewish people, our fellow citizens. But here's this Roman, not a Jew, a Gentile. He's a Roman, our enemy. And not only that, but he's an officer. He's a centurion over a hundred soldiers. How will Jesus respond? Well, Jesus says, I will come home with you and I'll cure him. But the centurion replies, no, that, that's not needed. There's no need for you to come to my house. I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. I know how this works, Jesus. I've been watching you. I've been watching the crowds. I know how it works. You just say the word and I know my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority. I say to one soldier, you go here and he goes. And I say to another, do this and he does that. And I say to another, come bring me this and he does. And Jesus heard this and he said that he was amazed. The Bible says he was amazed and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, there is no one in Israel like this guy. I have found such faith in such a one. Now I tell you, many will come from the east and the west and will eat with Abraham in the kingdom of heaven. While the heirs of the kingdom... The ones who are meant for the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the centurion then, uh, Jesus said to him, go, let it be done as you have said. Let it be done according to your faith. And that servant was healed within the hour. Jesus was amazed at his faith. It's interesting, Jesus has never been amazed by anybody's knowledge. <laughs> He's not, he's, he doesn't take any interest in how many trophies you have in your trophy case, how many degrees you have hanging on your wall, how much you know. But Jesus is amazed by a faith, by someone with faith. Now, here's the exact opposite. We read about this in Mark 6. A second time, Jesus is amazed when he's back in his hometown of Nazareth. Uh, he's starting to become famous now, and, but he's back in his hometown, and there's some jealousy going on. And they're thinking, hold it, Jesus, I mean... He grew up here. He's, he's just one of us, right? He's, he was a carpenter just like his dad, and he's, you know, his mother is Mary, and his brother is James, and Josie's, and Judas, and Simon, and, and his sisters all live here. I mean, what's so special about this guy? He's just one of us. But does he think he's better than us? Well, and because of that attitude, because of their lack of faith, Jesus could do no deeds of power. He couldn't heal anybody. They lacked the faith. Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. Hmm. So on the one hand, we've got big faith, and then we've got no faith. We've got mature faith that understands authority, that understands God's power, and then we have disbelief, unbelief, lack of faith. Amazing, huh? Well, perhaps you know somebody with big faith, do you? You know somebody has faith? I mean, real faith, real, they believe in the power of God. They believe in the power of prayer. They look at life through the lens of faith and God's faithfulness and how he comes through. They believe in a big God who's got the whole world in his hands. And even though things may not go their way, and in spite of that, they maintain their faith in God. You know people like that? I hope you do. And it's their faith in God that informs uh, their actions and their reactions. And that's important, isn't it? Jesus wants his followers then to be like that. He wants his followers now to be like that, where we believe and trust in the faithfulness of God. And when I say it's big faith, it's just, it's just faith, right? Really, the faith is in a big God. That's what it really is all about. God's the big one. We just simply believe. We simply trust. We simply obey. It makes a difference then in your worldview. It makes a difference on your outlook in life. 
uh, how you go about your relationships, when you're dating or when you're married or when you're at work or when you're out of work even, when you're at school or when you're on the team, when you're with the club. If you're healthy or if you're not healthy, you can still maintain that confidence and that faith in a big God. You see, because big faith pleases God. It makes a difference. It makes life better. It makes the world better. Do you need a definition of faith? Go to Hebrews chapter 11. It's a great book. Hebrews chapter 11. Maybe make that your devotional this week. Go through that passage. Hebrews 11. It's all good stuff there. Hebrews 11 one tells us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things not seen. There's your definition. Faith, the assurance of things hoped for and a conviction of what you don't see. But you know that God's going to work. You know it. And then all the rest of that chapter is about the people of faith through the Old Testament. Moses is mentioned there. Abraham is mentioned there. there there's a great list. And you can be a part of that list. People of faith. If, if were, the Bible was still to be written today, wouldn't it be great to have our names in there? Because we are children of faith as well. Mm. Well, five things lead to big, active, maturing, growing faith. Five catalysts, if you want to say it that way, of how you can mature and develop an audacious uh, faith in a great God. So if you want to grow, here we go, all right? Number one, practical teaching. We need practical teaching. We have to sit under the Word of God. Let it inform us. Let it transform us. Uh, we need to be pl in places where the Word can be explained to us. We see it. We hear it. We study it. We grapple with it. We chew on it. Uh, it's explained to us, and we put it into practice as well. Also, personal ministry. Each and every one of us needs a personal ministry. We are all called to be ministers, to be servants. And, and you may not have the title of ordained pastor. You don't need that. But if, if you are a believer, then Jesus calls you to be a servant. And it's, and it's just a ministry, whatever that ministry is. It's a ministry to your family if you're a husband, uh, to your wife, to your kids, to your grandkids, a ministry to your children if you're a mother, a, a ministry, uh, whether it's working in our food pantry here at church or serving as a Sunday school leader, uh, facilitating a group, all those kind of ways, personal ministry, helping out in our food pantry again, those kind of things, helping out in the youth ministry, being just an, another adult and in the, in the present in the room as we practice safe sanctuaries with that. But it's realizing that, hey, God, if you don't come through, I'm through. That's what it means to be in ministry. Lord, you've got to come through. You've got to work through me. Yes, I can do certain things, but it's got to be a, a, you, a you thing. It's got to be a God thing. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference. And God, you've got to come through or I'm through. And then there's private disciplines. That's a third catalyst. We need to practice private disciplines. That means getting into the word on your own beyond Sunday morning, getting into it on a daily basis, making it part of, of your daily practices. Uh, study, uh, giving, uh, serving, growing, worship, personal worship as well. Maybe it's walking and praying together, those kind of things. But these are small deposits that over time make a big difference. All these things, these first three here. Here's number four then, a providential relationships. Have you experienced providential relationships? It's kind of like when you say, you know, I was kind of here in my faith. I'm not, I'm not here yet, but I was here in my faith. And then I met somebody and boom, it just bumped me up even a notch further because they challenged me. They spurred me on. They, they inspired me. Maybe it's that relationship where God brings that person into your life at such a right time. And boom, you, you've grown in your faith because of that. You need those providential relationships. You also need five pivotal circumstances. Those circumstances in life that happen, and they often just come at us. Sometimes they're big, sometimes they're bad, sometimes they're ugly. But God uses them to get our attention, uh, to rekindle our fire of faith, to, to uh, reignite our passion. Sometimes we think we're fine without God until we're not. Huh? We're fine without God until we're not. Then we realize we need him. And sometimes God uses those pivotal circumstances, again, to get our attention. Now, the local church can only do so many things of this list, really just the first two, is what they can help you in and encourage you in, the practical teaching, uh, getting a personal ministry. But we've got to engage, we've got to step up, we've got to participate in. It's the last three there, the private disciplines, the providential relationships and the, and the pivotal circumstances that are best experienced not in rows, but in circles. And when I mean circles, I mean small groups, small groups of people that you get together with. That might be a Sunday school class. 
Uh, that might be a home group. That might be a group that you meet with once or twice a month, maybe once or twice a week even. And it's in those groups that you're with people that maybe share the, some of the same passions that you do or some of the same life experiences. Maybe they're in parenting years. Maybe they're in their grandparenting years. Maybe they're in their widowed issues that they're dealing with. Maybe it's guy things or gal issues. And let me tell you, something wonderful happens in that experience of not rows but in circles. Uh, when, you're, when you're a close-knit group and you're getting to know one another, you're sharing life together, six experiences happen in circle groups. First of all, small groups are a safe place to process out loud, to process out loud life. Here's what you're going through, and you've got a few other trusted people that you can share that with. And How do you deal with this? How do you wrestle with this? I'm at a low point. How do I get out of this? Or, or I'm traveling pretty high. How can I be helpful to somebody else? But you process within that group out loud uh, what's going on in life. Also, you can share your doubts. Share your doubts with one another. Ask the questions. As number three that goes along with that. You know, I'm struggling here. How do I, how do I get, come over, the, overcome this? Uh, here's some of the questions that I have. How do I, how do I wrestle with it? Number four, here's where you get to tell your stories as well. Have you ever t- told your story to somebody? Something really happens, especially in a small group, when you start to share your stories together, a connection that's instant- instantaneous happens and takes place, and it just, it just bonds you together more. A fifth... Uh, Uh, experience from a small group is that you get to pray with and be prayed for in a small group. Hard to do that personally within a church service and something bigger than that. And I wonder, when's the last time did you get to hear somebody pray out loud for you by name? Has that ever happened? I hope it has. But but imagine the people that it's never happened to at all. That's what broke my heart this this summer when, when Robin and I got to travel to Japan to visit our son Alex there. And just being on, on uh, those uh, different uh, subway trains and just traveling. People getting on the trains, not looking at one another, just looking at their phones or whatever they are doing. And nobody paying attention and nobody ever hearing probably the name of Jesus, let alone that somebody would pray for them by name and lift them before the presence of Jesus. Well, here on Sunday morning, we get to experience wonderful worship and music and uh, teaching and inspiration. But it's in a small group that it gets more real. It gets more personal. In a group, number six, we get to become accountable to one another. Accountable. That means it matters whether I'm following through on my private devotions. I'm, I'm talking to the, my group about that. Hey, I blew it this week. Or hey, no, I, I, I read five days a week. Uh, and I'm doing pretty well. But you can be accountable with one another. And it's there day after day or week after week or month after month that you get to be challenged to do, to grow, to change, to try. Uh, to start, to, to become more than you are now. And it's in the doing that makes the difference, doesn't it? Not just the believing, but the doing. Because when our faith becomes action, things change. In our faith, if it's just belief, then really nothing changes. You will be more likely to follow through with people of faith surrounding you. You'll be more likely to follow through with people of faith surrounding you. When you finally decide to change that relationship, to, to finally, finally get rid of it, to get out of it, or maybe to say, no, I've got to make, be, make a more commitment to it. Maybe I need to give more. Maybe I need to change my job. Maybe I need to stop that habit or start this spiritual discipline. That group can support you. <laughs> the Sunday preacher really can't do that for you. It happens in small groups. And it's there that group, group life is experienced and happened. And it's there that we become not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. That's what our passage was from James 1. Be doers of the word and not hearers only who deceive themselves. Now somebody wants to say, now wait a minute, pastor. Don't I get credit for just showing up? (laughs) Well, that's why why James goes on to say, don't be deceived. You've got to be a doer of it, not just a hearer. you you're You're not putting one over on James and God's not buying it, so do what it says. Change comes from doing and not just hearing. Now, the changing and the doing doesn't get us into heaven, but it allows life to be more heavenly here on earth, doesn't it? Because we have invited in then God's faithfulness into every situation of our lives, into our relationships, into our work, uh, into our health, into our families. We're inviting in the faithfulness of God. 
But James goes on to say, now what happens, what's it like if you just listen only and never get to do what it says? Well, he goes on to say that. He says it's like getting up in the morning, walking into the bathroom, looking in the mirror and going, eh. <laughs> and then not doing anything about it. <laughs> and just going on with your day, going on to school or going on to work. Which we would, we, would, we would say, I would never do that, right? If I'm going to look in the mirror, I'm going to you know, spruce up, I'm going to brush my teeth, I'm going to wash my face, I'm going to comb my hair. We would never do that. James is saying it's, it's what we do then when we hear the word and do it. Because if not, we might get convicted about it, but if we never do anything about it, that's like just walking into the mirror and going, eh. Now, we do know people that do that, right? People that get up in the morning and look in the mirror and don't do anything about it. We call them children. <laughs> right? James is saying, don't be children. <laughs> don't be immature. Grow up. Don't be a child. Don't do in your spiritual life what you wouldn't do in your physical life, right? And why don't we do that in our physical life? Because we know other people are going to see us. Ah, that's it, isn't it? And James is saying that other people are going to see you. That's why you need to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. People are going to see you. They're going to see how you react to life. People want to know, especially people of no faith, they want to know you, that you call yourself a Christian. How does it work when you get bad news? You know, how does it work when you succeed? How does it work when you don't get your way? People of no faith want to know, does it work? Does Jesus work or not? Does this faith thing work or not? Again, the last three keys there, that private disciplines, the providential relationships, the pivotal circumstances, those best happen in a circle when you can process and share that together more than it does just on a, on a line of, of a row of pews. It's most meaningfully experienced in a small group. Think about relationships when it comes that way. And I know some people are, are leery about getting in a small group, especially guys, because guys are thinking, I don't want to cry, right? <laughs> and you don't have to. Uh, some small groups get that deep, some don't. And it's up to you whether you're going to be emotional or not. Some are leery because they think, well, you know, small groups are engineered. You know, if, if we sign up for one at church, it's going to be because other people signed up and, and they're just kind of putting us together and, and it's this mosh thing for a while. But think about it. Every relationship you've ever had has been engineered to some degree. You did not choose when you would be born. You did not choose to whom you would be born. You did not choose your siblings. You did not choose the school you went to. You were just there. You didn't even choose your best friend from sixth grade. They were there because you were there, and that's how you met up. If it wouldn't have been for school, if it wouldn't have been for that, uh, putting those things together, that would have never happened. You know, my best friend who has been my spouse for 36 years, that was an engineered experience because she and I happened to be at the same place, same time, in Wilmore, Kentucky. Imagine that, a Pennsylvania boy and a Cincinnati girl meeting up in Kentucky. And there we were. And it happened. It was engineered, yes. But that's how God uses, uses things and experiences and uh, providential relationships to get us together. You think about those pivotal circumstances in your life, and sometimes they're disruptive. Uh, sometimes they're big. Sometimes they're bad. And you would think, man, I don't want this, and, and <laughs> I don't want to have to deal with this. And sometimes bad events will either do one of two things. It will either strengthen us, or to destroy us. It can strengthen a person's faith or destroy a, a person's faith. What makes the difference is not that experience, though, because stuff happens to everybody. The Lord even says, you know, he's going to let the rain fall on the just and the unjust. But here's what makes the difference, three things. What we believe, who we listen to, and how we frame it. That determines whether an experience is going to destroy us or strengthen us. And a small group plays a significant role in that. That's, that's where you can cry with one another if you need to cry and, and to, to simply complain to one another or even to, to argue with one another. Hey, why is God letting this happen? Why is it happening now? Why is it happening so big? A small group allows you to process that, to pray for one another, to care for one another in the midst of that because you are far more likely to make it through with people of faith surrounding you. You can make it through with people of faith surrounding you. We need people. God made us to be social beings. And people help us find God in the midst of our storms. And we can be there to help somebody else in the midst of their storm find God too. 
Because if we can find God in it, we are far more likely to maintain faith through it. If we can find God in it, we're more likely to maintain faith through it. It's amazing uh, to me. That, uh, again, these, these different principles we learned today. People with big faith, a centurion, not even a Jewish believer. And yet he saw Jesus and he saw this, this guy's got the power of God. And if you, have you been watching The Chosen? Some of you have. Uh, Robin's leading a Bible study on it. Man, the one about the centurion was powerful. <laughs> it was a great, ep- a couple episodes worth of stuff there. So that's a good one to see. But Jesus was amazed at his faith and then amazed at the lack of faith even from his own town, from his hometown, hometown folks. They didn't get it. I think about then the disciples on the boat with Jesus. Remember, they were going across the Galilee Sea and uh, a storm rose up. Jesus happened to fall asleep. That's how content he was. That's how at peace he was. The disciples are all worried to death. They're frantic. They're probably bailing out the water. And they're thinking, we're going to die. We're going to die. And they forgot Jesus was in the boat with them. See, we need people of faith in small groups to help us and point to God, who's there even in the midst of our storms, isn't he? He's there. We may not see him. We may not experience him. We may not feel him. But our faith is more than feeling its fact, isn't it? My faith is a fact. My faith is a fact and that there was a man that came here some 2,000 years ago that said he was the Son of God and then it did the stuff of the Son of God. That he said he would be delivered over to sinners and be crucified. But that three days later he would rise again. He said it and then he did it. That's my faith based on fact, not feeling. It's an actual fact. Jesus was here. He did what he said he did. The grave is empty. He's no longer there. Our faith is factual, my friends, not just feeling. That's, it's wonderful when the feelings come. Wonderful when you have a church service, a revival, or something happens, and you feel something. But my faith is more than that. It has to be. It has to be. Faith, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Our Lord wants us to be people of faith, big faith, because we believe in a big God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for the joy of today, of getting into your word once again, of worshiping you and celebrating with your your family of faith, Lord. Men and women, boys and girls who love Jesus. Mm. Thank you for this reminder from James, James, the the half-brother of Jesus, who later came to faith himself, who at first thought, nah, that's just Jesus, he's kind of weird. But then after he rose again, he, he believed. Not only was Jesus then a brother, he was Lord. Well, Lord, maybe today is where we come back to you again. Be more than just a friend or more than just somebody we talked about in Sunday school when we were little. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. Be my, the one who shapes my life. Be my king, my leader. Mm. Father, once again, I'm committing my life to you afresh today. You claim me, and so I want to claim you. I'm your child, I'm your daughter, I'm your son. And now I'm claiming you, my Lord. Help us then to trust your wonderful and great and big faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, let's sing one time as we...